Thank you, Judith. And uh, hi there, folk on the uh, Zoom and the other systems. You are as much welcome here as uh, all the folk gathered here this morning are. I, I want to make a confession to you. Uh, the message I bring to you this morning, I've used before. Not here, I had to say. <laughs> So, you know, you don't want, don't want to put your hand up and say, I know it, I know it, I know it. Um, but it's been interesting that what I actually wrote was before the 7th of October. And I battled to try and get something that was relevant to the 7th of October. And I don't know whether you feel the same, but I felt so distressed by it all that I thought I'm going to stick with what I was originally going to do. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't work for you, be gentle with me, won't you? You know, it was, a, it was one of those experiences where I looked and I thought, well, maybe God's telling me that I need to say something different. If not, he'll, he'll sort me out. And so will you. <laughs> but it's good to come here. It's good to come here together to worship all one in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We begin by singing hymn number 11, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So let's come before our God in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we have come before you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
setting aside time and space in our lives so that we can reflect on your greatness and rejoice in your goodness and respond to you with gladness. Lord, receive once more the worship that we bring. We come in awe, we come in wonder, we come in reverence and humility. Receive once more our worship. We come with our praise, we come with our thanksgiving, our joy and celebration, and we ask, receive once more our worship. And we come to share fellowship with one another, to come and make our confession to you and to one another. We come to pray for ourselves, pray for our world and our loved ones, and to offer gifts and our service. Receive once more our worship. How do we come? We come gladly. We come obediently. We come hungrily. We come confidently in all your goodness. So receive once more our worship. Especially, Lord, we come seeking your presence with us, your guidance, your strength, and your mercy. See once more our worship. Loving God, we are all here before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask that you will receive our worship, receive our faith, and receive each one of us as individuals, young and old. Help us to receive all you would give us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I was a bit disappointed to find that a number of our young people are away on holiday or whatever. Because I always like when I come here, I always like to do something for the young people. So what do I do? Will you allow the older ones to get involved in it as well? <laughs> but I, I, I've got a, a question that you might all like to consider, and it's this. If you were able to visit one place that you've visited before, note that, that you've visited before, where would it be, and why is it that you would want to go back there? I'm going to start with our younger people. Have you had time to think? Where would it be? Cape Town. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't... Cape Town. Cape Town. Oh, dear me, been before. You shouldn't say Cape Town this morning after last night's <laughs> No, you can, of course. Yeah. Why is it you want to go back to Cape Town? Um, to see more of it. Right, right. Any others? No? No? <laughs> Well, I give the adults a chance. Is there somewhere where you've been before where you'd look at and say, you know, I'd really like to go back there again? Nether Poppleton. Nether Poppleton. Nether Poppleton. I I'm surprised not every hand has gone up to say, yes, me too. <laughs> Never, you you've got family there, haven't you? I used to live there as a child. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Any more volunteers? But fast, oh, but, but they make drink there, don't they? I'm going to tell you where I would go. I would go to a place in Kent called Hyde. <laughs> the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch Railway. I would love to go back there and see that. It's absolutely wonderful. 
And when I've spoken to people about places they'd like to go, one person once said to me, not too long ago, oh, he said, that I can't remember where it was they actually picked on. They said, oh, to me, it's holy ground. Have you ever said that about that thing? Oh, it's holy ground. And what they really mean is, you know, it's a nice place. I, I, I really like it. And your place to visit is special. And you could call Lower Poppleton and, and Buckfarts and whatever you've named, certainly Cape Town, you know, that's holy ground for you because it's something special. It's something special for you. Do you remember the story of Moses and the burning bush? Yeah, all, all into but Moses and the burning bush and how it was that Moses went up and saw a bush burning and it wasn't being devoured and all this sort of thing. And can you remember what God said to Moses? I'm almost tempted to give a prize, but I won't. Take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. Why? Because you're standing on holy ground. When I did this service once before, I took off my shoes. But I'm not going to do that today because I've, <laughs> I've got a hole in my sock. <laughs> but when Moses heard those words, when he saw the burning bush, and he heard God speaking to him, saying, take off your shoes, you are on holy ground. What that really means is, you are near God. And I say that again, that holy ground that Moses traveled on was because he was near God. And I say to all of us, young and old, that as we get older, and we look back and find people and places visiting them, or them visiting us, that that experience does, I find, bring us closer to God. It's special holy ground for us. So as younger folk get older, and old folk get older still, remember, go back and remember places and people that meant something very important to you. Because that is, folks, your holy ground. Promise me you'll remember? I'll do my best to remember myself as well. Holy ground. We're going to sing another hymn before our young people go downstairs. And it's number 164. Your words to me are life and health. surprised by this, Moses and the burning bush. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I haven't got any holes in my socks. <laughs> now, Moses was tending the flock of Jericho, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, 
And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So, when the Lord saw he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Hear the word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning comes from Matthew 17, verses 1 to 8. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. So you won't be surprised that the uh, subject I want to share with you and the thoughts come under the heading of Holy Ground. Those examples that were mentioned in our service, we could probably, if we sat down and had a good think about it, you could make a longer list of things that you looked at, places you'd been, people that you've known, and said that in knowing them and being there, there was a sense of walking on holy ground. And our first reading about Moses and that incredible experience of the burning bush, I like conjuring tricks, and I'd love to know how God did it. <laughs> but you'll remember that that situation was quite dire. Because Israel, nothing new here, was under, impression, under oppression from Egypt. The Israelites were subject to forced labour. And Pharaoh issued an order against the Israelites. And he said that all newborn baby boys should be put to death. The girls were all right, but it was that way of trying to control the population of Israel. And in the earlier part of that reading from Exodus, we would have seen the part how it is that one mother had a little baby boy, and so that she could protect him, she put him in a basket and set him afloat on the River Nile. And the little fella's sister went and were observed to see just what happened here. And who should turn up out of all people but Pharaoh's daughter? Now you would have thought quite reasonably that Pharaoh's daughter would look and say, baby boy, in a basket, come out, this was supposed to be put to death. I'm gonna have a word with dad. But she didn't. She was filled with compassion and sympathy. And she went to Moses' sister and said, I know a lady who would be a very, very good nurse for this little one. And of course, the, little, the, the, the nurse was going to be Moses' mother. 
And Moses, through that route, got involved in Israel. And he rose to great things. He rose to great things politically and he became, well, the Moses that we know nowadays. And there's one occasion when he saw an Egyptian, an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And what did he do? He went up and got hold of the Egyptian and gave him a good thrashing and killed him. Which isn't the smartest thing to do when you're in that situation in Egypt. So he fled. And he fled and he became part of the family of Jethro. And he married Jethro's daughter. And then we come to this reading how it is that he's out tending the flocks. Burning bush, not being destroyed. And he must have said to himself, I'm, I'm going to have a closer look at this and see what's going on. And, as you would. But God spoke from the bush. The words he said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place you're standing on is holy ground. <coughs> I can focus back on that expression of holy ground. This was something, I, I'm sure it's not recorded, but I cannot believe that Moses didn't go back to that place time and time again and say to himself, this is where God spoke to me. Holy ground, a place where he was in the presence of God. Lovely thought. But Moses wasn't unique. There were others that we have recorded in scripture of people who found holy ground. Now in our second reading, we heard about Peter, James and John. And it's the time of the transfiguration. And in the transfiguration, as we know, Scriptures tell us that Jesus' face shone. He wore white clothes and Peter, James and John saw Moses talking with Jesus and with Elijah. Blow me down, there's a big sight, isn't it? And they're talking together. And my translation about Peter's responses is says, Peter blurted out. <laughs> Not Peter commented and suggested. Peter blurted out, it's good for us to be here. It's good to be here. And shall I put up three plaques for you? One for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you, Jesus. Jesus didn't need that. And there was a voice from the cloud that came and said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And I'm going to suggest to you that those three disciples went back to that place time and time again, as Moses did to his burning bush, and looked and said to his colleagues, fellow disciples, do you remember that time? Do you remember that time when God spoke to us? When God spoke to us, and we saw Elijah, and we saw Moses, and we heard God saying that this Jesus is my son. It was holy ground, a place where they had encountered God. That's the essence of the expression holy ground, a place where they were in the presence of God. So we've had a look at Moses, we've had a look at the disciples. What about your personal experience of holy ground? My experience of holy ground because the more I've thought about it, I'm absolutely convinced that we've all experienced our own holy ground. There have been moments in your life where you've sensed the closeness of God so deeply that you, you blurted, blurted out almost, I'm standing on holy ground. 20 years ago, I was invited to go back to the chapel that Anne and I worshipped at in East London. It was their anniversary service. And I was asked if I would preach and take the service on their anniversary. And when I came into the church and walked up to the pulpit, not dissimilar to this, I looked at the front where we knelt for communion and my mind went back another 20 years 
to the 3rd of April, 1960. You remember the 3rd of April, 1960, don't you? No, of course you don't. But I do, because on that night in the chapel, our minister made an appeal for those who wanted to follow Jesus to come forward to the communion rail. <laughs> I and I've said this one to you before. I was with a couple of my mates, and one of them leaned over to me and said, you're not going, are you? And I said, I think so. And the other mate turned and said, are you going? And by that time, I was walking down the, uh, the, the middle of the church to the communion rail. And my friend Tony said to me, I wanted to shout out, Stevie, don't do it! <laughs> When, when I see Tony, we, we always, that always comes up. But Stevie did it. And when I walked down, I reflected that I was on holy ground. There was in that particular moment. And, and not everybody comes to Jesus that way, but it did for me. And going down there, I was conscious that there was something happening in my life. Something was changing. And by the grace of God and his love and his power, it's continued. I've only had a few slip-ups along the way, but 40-odd years where I've looked back on that time of being close to God. I did actually reflect whether I should have taken my shoes off at that time, but no, I spared everybody that one. But that time, my individual experience, I remember to, uh, you, you would doubtless have the similar experiences in your own mind of situations when you walked on holy ground. There was something that drew you close to God. And I remember my dad telling me a story. My dad was orphaned at quite a young age. His father died. His father worked on the Southern Railway and my father and his brothers went to the Southern Railway Servants' Orphanage. No, no wonder I like trains. <laughs> but he went to the Southern Railway Servants' Orphanage at Woking. And I can remember how he told me that next door to the actual place, the home where they stayed, was a mosque. And he always went on about this mosque. He said, he said, the chaps that are in that mosque, they're really very friendly. They're really very kind, really, really very, very nice. Many years later, I was in Woking, on work, and I thought, I must go down and see where it was my dad and his brothers were brought up. Down I went, and um, it had all been developed, and it was very different from what dad uh, had seen. But I said to the lady, the secretary there, I said, is there a mosque around here? Oh yes, she said, yes, yes, there's, there's a mosque. You know, it's the Shahan Mosque. And it is, believe it or not, the oldest mosque in the UK. 1889, and I thought, well, I must go down and actually have a look at this place that was so important to my dad, where he was so impressed by the inhabitants. And as I walked down, coming towards me was the imam, and I thought, I'm going to get chucked out here. And as we got closer, he looked, he smiled, he said, good afternoon, he said, uh, are, are you visiting? And I told him the story, how it was that my father had been an orphan and he had great stock on this, this mosque. And he said, would you like to come inside? What do you think I said? Yeah, of course I did, didn't I? I said, yeah, I'd love to. And we got to the door. And what do you think he said? Yeah. Take your shoes off. <laughs> so I, I, I did. I did, I took my shoes off and I went in and I will never forget it. Inside there must have been about a dozen people all at prayer. And I truly, cross my heart, I truly felt, felt the presence of God there. Maybe it was the kindness of this man. Maybe it was the fact that there were people there worshipping. But it was so, so warm. And I thanked him when I came out. And I said, you know, I really have been blessed by that. It was wonderful. But I mentioned it because that same thing that Moses had had, take your shoes off, take your shoes off, it was repeated a couple of thousand years later. Holy ground. 
And I started, I, I thought about you Moses' holy ground, I thought about the disciples' holy ground, I thought about my personal holy ground, some of it, and encourage you to think about your own. And um, what about us? What about us as a fellowship? What do we think is our holy ground? There was a time, and this is just a sign of how old I was, that there was a certain formula for people coming into church. Gentlemen never wore their hats. Ladies always wore a hat. And it was a, a, quite a ritual. And I thought, well, yeah, this is almost like taking your shoes off and stuff, putting your hat on or leaving it off. And um, Joy, I'm going to mention one of your relatives here, your dear dad, Jack. And many of you will remember dear Jack Robinson, lovely fella. And whenever he came to church, came up there through the door, and what was he wearing? His hat. And it was a, it was, it was a regular thing that I would go up behind him, push his hat over his eyes and say, take your hat off in church. <laughs> and we did that until he passed on. But that ritual of being there. But shoes off? No, I, I can't remember anyone taking their shoes off, and I'm not going to start the tradition. Either. But I do believe that we as a congregation, as a fellowship, when we are here, we are on holy ground. We are on holy ground. When we come to communion and we gather around the rail, or whatever way we gather, we are walking, treading, on holy ground and it's a privilege for us all to be here this morning because folks I'm going to tell you without doubt we are on holy ground some of us have been to this church for a long time some of them are not very long but we can all reflect on times when we've worshipped here and we have sensed the presence of God there have been times when we have been here and we have met and spoken with people, not necessarily preachers, but folk who have shared something of God with us, that has deepened our own faith. And those moments, I want to say, oh, I was on holy ground there. Wasn't I blessed to have good friends like that? Wasn't I good to belong to a fellowship like this? And I look and I say to God, I'm on holy ground. I'm going to encourage you that when we come into church in future, maybe you do it already, and if you do, forgive me, but when we come into church, as we come up the steps or through the lift, whatever it is we come through, come through the door and reflect that you are entering holy ground. Holy ground, a place where you have come to be closer to God. A place where you have come because God wants to get closer to you. As I say, it might not be as intense as a burning bush, non-consumable fire. It might not be witnessing Jesus and the ascension. But it is holy ground. Whatever it is coming close to us. It might even be, like mine is, to consider the time when I first made a commitment to Jesus all those years ago. Perhaps you're the same. But whatever, I've made a promise to myself and you, I'll give it over to you, you might want to take it on for yourself as well. I've made a promise to myself that when I come into this church, every time as I come through those doors, I'm going to look up and I'm going to say, Lord, I'm on holy ground. Now, who knows, it might be a, a business meeting. Is it a business meeting? Is that holy ground, Judith? <laughs> Sometimes they are, but even formal meetings to know that we are God's people, that when we come into this place, we are walking on holy ground. One week after the other, one day after the other, here we are as a church family. With or without shoes, with or without hats or anything else. I encourage you, I encourage me to claim the truth that here and now, 
We come here to meet with our God. And when we do so, guess what we're walking on? Holy ground. Holy ground. God bless you all. And may you continue to walk on that holy ground all through your lives. Amen. Amen. I chose our next hymn, number 434, because it is Angus Top Lady's, August Top Lady's song. He was Blagden curate, caught in the storm at Burrington Combe. And some of you may have seen, that. I'm sure you've all seen, there's a, a recognition, there's a plaque stating that August Top Lady had stood in that rock, that cleft in the rock, to shelter from the storm. And... Um, I, and when I was reading more about it, they said, oh, well, we're not sure that that really happened. I don't care, I think it did. <laughs> that there was, that there was all this top lady sheltering, and he was in holy ground. So let's sing together his hymn, number 434, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. to make our offering to God's word. I, I, I believe, Dave, you want me to say something about embrace? Embrace. Uh, yes, today, today's offering is going to... Uh, That's what I was going to say. I didn't want to announce it and get it all wrong, so I'm just looking for the announcement. Um, but the offering is going to a Christian organisation called Embrace, who work with Christian partners across the region, including Gaza. They're providing crucial life-saving support, working in awful conditions, bringing what hope they can. Bless them. In the Middle East, that is, that they are at work, and our offering this morning will go to embrace. Thank you. We'll take it off.
Heavenly Father, we bring our gifts to you, that they may be used well and wisely, particularly in the work that is being undertaken by embrace. We bring these gifts of free will, not because we have to, but because we want to. So Lord, may they be blessed, bless those that work for embrace, and bless us as we seek to set examples of love, and care and compassion in whatever way we are called. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with our prayers of intercession. And it's hard for us to know just where we ought to begin. Because the events of the past two weeks in Gaza, and Israel have left us distressed and have left us confused. We pray, Lord, for those people who have been caught up in this awful tragedy and others who also are suffering. We pray for peace and we pray for justice and for a resolution in this troubled time. Lord, where there is despair, grant that there may be hope. Where there is fear, that trust might abound. Where there is hate, may there be love. And where there is war, Father, may there be peace. We do not have all the answers because we haven't got all the information. But we ask your hand of wisdom and peace to be on those that have got wider knowledge. But, oh Lord, above everything, we crave for an end to this wickedness and that peace may come and that innocent lives may not be lost any longer. Father, into your hands we put this issue as we continue to pray for that situation. We pray, Lord, also for the situation between Russia and Ukraine, which seems to have gone off the agenda in the face of what's gone on in Israel and Gaza. But there were still problems, and we just wonder how it is that people can show such wickedness such lack of concern for others, particularly young children. Lord, our world is in a very difficult situation and we can only come to you and trust. We can only pray that you will give wisdom and guidance to those who have it within their remit to resolve the conflicts. Father, we pray also for the work of Open Doors. And we've been asked to pray for a previous husband who forced her children from home after his wife became a Christian. They're supported with food, rent and education by Open Doors partners. And a previous is asked, pray that my loved ones will be converted and that my eldest son will find work and pray that I will be strengthened in Christ. A PBO, we do just that. That God's hand may be on you and God Jesus' spirit be within you and all of your family. We pray for Susie Simmons, our dear friend, who has lost her dad. We pray for her and all the family that they may have peace throughout this time. We lift them up before you. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship and the holy ground that we tread here, that there is love and friendship. We're thankful that there is support when we are in difficulty. We thank you, Lord, that there is love when we are in need of it. 
But Father, just in a quiet moment, here is time for each of us as individuals to bring before you those matters that bring us concern personally. Hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for all the initiatives that we have seen over the past years with young people, with home groups, with Zoom, with all manner of things. And we are grateful for those who are gifted in these areas. May we continue to grow. May we continue to show your love in the way that we live and the way that we work. For we ask this and all of our prayers in and through the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day of our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into So we close our worship together as we sing the hymn 504, May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. Thanks be to you, O God. Amen. Amen.